Welcome everybody. It's the uh, last day before the, well, last class before the midterm, I guess. Um, just, whoa. Uh, could the person that asked me the first question before class raise their hand and re-ask that question? Yeah. Or um, random person in the audience, yes. Right, so the uh, question is on project three, should we assume that the test cases are all single letter terminals and non-terminals? No, they're strings. Why, how do you know? You're just intuiting my brain? In the project description, there's explicit definitions for what the tokens are, what they're made of, right? And so. Um, the other way to think about this is to think like me, right? You're the professor who has to evaluate these things. You want to evaluate not just can you code it, but the main thing you're trying to evaluate is are you following the specification and implementing a program that does all of this specification, right? So if you think about um, you think about the specification says I want a program that looks like this. Right? That's what the specification says. And so test cases are really just points inside here. Right? But I'm testing like some specific functionality. So if the description says that tokens and non-terminals can be any length, and the test cases that we're giving you are only of length one, probably be safe to assume that other test cases are testing other, so like all those one unit test cases are all in here, right? And so if your program's only doing this, you're not doing the entire specification, right? So that's why we're gonna test other things. And if you think about it like this, we may test things close to the border, right? What we know we're not gonna do is we're not gonna give you something outside. So we're not gonna give you something that's invalid. That could be another way to test these things. Right? So what you kind of want to think about are what are the bounds, right? What are, so what could be, what kind of things have I been harping that you can like do wrong in your project threes? Not modifying the lexer. Lexer, yes. Not modifying the lexer, right? So if you didn't modify the lexer, what are some keywords in the lexer from project two? If, so could you create a, in our project three grammar, can you create a non-terminal or a terminal that's called if? Yes. yes. Yeah, could that work? Yes. Yes. That's testing another point in this specification. What are some other things? So I was talking about that a lot, what other things? What about when you calculate your first sets? How should you calculate, let's say, first sets? What's our algorithm like at a super high level for calculating first sets? Check each rule. What other things? Initializing empty sets. Yeah, initialize. So why do we initialize everything with empty set? Uh, it's possible that they're all empty. What do we do? We want to write our first sets algorithm in a recursive way? Did we do that recursively? Yes. When we did it by hand? <laughs> Calculating first sets? Yeah. Iterative, right? We're iterating over all the rules in the grammar and then all the rules in our first set calculus. Or we're technically we're iterating over all non-terminals in our grammar and then for each non-terminal we iterate for every rule that that non-terminal for first sets appears on the left hand side. We're iterating and applying all five of those rules that we have to see how that changes the first set. What we're not doing is we're not saying the first of A, if A is on the left hand side, is the first of B. So then we recursively call calculate first of B. Because what if B is something like B goes to A? Right? This is why we initialize everything to empty first sets to not have this problem. Yes? So I'm curious, so what conditions should you meet when you're doing the first sets to stop it? What is the condition you like, should meet when you do first sets to stop it? I meant the, because I, I know that the first sets is when, when nothing's changed. Yep. But is, is there a way to indicate that like in a program? 
Yeah. So one way is to use a flag. Okay. You can have a Boolean flag that at the beginning you set change to zero, and then anytime you make a change to a first set, you set it to one. Um, another way to do it would be to make a complete copies of the first sets. Right? Create A through whatever non terminal you have, create copies, so call it old A, old B, old C, whatever, or old first sets, right? Calculate the new first sets and then compare them all, right? If you compare them all and they're all not, if they all have not changed, then you know you're good and you can um, stop. Cool. What are some other common problems that maybe you can have? Like projects two, what were the, some of the bugs there? Segmentation fault is the silent killer of project threes. Right? So that's actually hard because it's just our regular test, and your program does this thing but crashes over on these inputs. Right? And so when you're generating test cases, if you're not generating test cases that could potentially crash your program, but are still valid inputs, then you're not going to pass the test cases, right? So you have to be very careful while you should. So when we say, so what are the main causes of a segmentation fault? Yeah, so no memory not allocated. So trying to de usually it's trying to dereference a null value. So what are the ways you can dereference something in C or C? star operator, so if I have some pointer and I have star pointer, if this, the address that's in here is zero or null, it's going to cause a segmentation fault. What's the other way of accessing, dereferencing a pointer? Arrow. Arrow. <coughs> What's the difference between these two? Who's an element? What was that? Who's an element? Yeah, so what this really means, all this is, is syntactic shorthand for pointer dot foo, right? So actually, in this case, pointer, to use the arrow syntax, pointer, the type of pointer must point to a struct, because you're accessing a specific field in that struct in C. But really what you're doing, you're just dereferencing and accessing that field. This is the exact same syntax. So at any place in your code, you are doing dereferencing of pointers. You better make sure that you're pointing to the correct thing and that that thing exists. There is something to point to. If you're pointing to null, then you have a problem. So like we did test cases, right? You want to look at your program and see how, like measure the code coverage of your own program on the test cases that you have. Maybe you're not exercising all of your code and there's a bug in some parts of your code that are not being exercised. So then you can think, how can I make a test case that exercises that code? Because it's likely that our test cases are exercising that code. Right? Similarly, between any pointer dereference, make sure it's not null. That's like the first thing you can do. And think about why, like prove to yourself, can it ever be null throughout all pass paths throughout the program from main to this point where you're dereferencing it, could it ever be null? Cool. Any other questions? These are the, of like every project besides logic problems. So there can be logic problems sometimes. Uh, especially, what are some common logic problems? How do you compare character pointers in C? Yeah. Right? You have to use this function. You cannot say, if you have two character pointers, foo and bar, you can't say, does foo equal equal to bar? This is not going to work. You also may need to, depending on how you're using sets, Right, if you're using a set library or you're using a list library, how does that set test for equality? 
Does it, if you're using character pointers, does it actually use string compare to compare strings, or is it using the equality operator to compare strings? Right? Because you want to say, is epsilon in this set? Well, how do you do that? I think these are pretty much 90% of the errors and bugs that I've seen throughout the years of students bringing code in. It's one of these cases. So in order to know uh, what kind of operation it is doing to compare, you have to read the documentation, right? Yes. Uh, read the documentation. Oh, yes, of your whatever you're using for sets or lists. Yes. You need to figure out how does it compare equality. So what if we want to change that? Do we overload it? Depends on the specific way. Uh, depends on the specific class that you're using. Sometimes you can define an equality operator. Sometimes you may have to do it yourself. You may have to iterate over that set and use string compare to compare what you're comparing to, right? You can define a function called is it in this set using string compare or whatever, right? So you can definitely help yourself out. Cool. Any other project three questions? Good girl's done. Keep these in mind. These are the core problems. All right. And then back to scoping. OK, so it's a little weird because we're starting off mid-execution of this program. Yes? Question about scoping. Yes. That I didn't know, but I experienced as I was working on task zero. OK. Can you not declare? Instantiate variables inside of case blocks. Ooh. Pilot was yelling at me. Uh, no, because they don't have actual blocks by default. In C, when you do a case, you don't actually include the braces, right? So if I put braces around it, it'll stop yelling at me? I believe so. Interesting. I'm not 100% on that. You have to check the exact syntax. Yeah, I ran into that. You, you can throw braces around it. Perfect. Inside the case, yeah. See, something you learned in here, helping programming projects. Amazing, right? <laughs> Who knew this stuff was actually relevant? Cool. OK. So to refresh our memories, to revive this discussion of where we are, so we've talked about static scoping, which looks specifically at the scope in the program. So a program C is valid, this declaration of this variable C is valid only in this block and any children of that block statically. And we can do this by looking at this. We don't have to execute the program. We don't have to think about the execution. We can map each usage to a declaration and we can do that statically. The flip side is dynamic scoping and that's what we're looking at here where as we've seen, we stepped through this code and we executed. So this top level box here is the symbol table that is being dynamically built as this program is executed. And it's being dynamically built. So we have x, bar, foo, baz, uh, the body of bar, and then main. And then we have the types of those variables. And here in the third column, we have the values. So we see that x currently has the integer 10. And the arrows kind of show us where we where our execution went, right? So we uh, first went up here. We set x to be 10. But when we saw this usage of x, right, dynamically at runtime, we need to look it up and say, what does this x refer to? So this x, we look up in our symbol table from the most recent block in our symbol table to the oldest. So in this case, it's going to be from the bottom to the top, yes. So with, so with dynamic scoping, then I can tell from, from if, there, if there's an x that's a, a char and a character, it can, tell which, it can tell which one is being called for. Let's say it's an integer compared to a character or string. No, so it cannot. Okay. It is simply looking at name matching. So it's not trying to say which x is this most likely because I'm pairing this x to an integer which means it should also be an integer. Uh, that's 
something actually completely different, which is type inference, which we'll look at later, where you can actually do cool stuff like that. Okay, but with this then, if it, if it checks back and I'm just looking at a 10 and the previous one was a char, it will throw an error then? Yep, it would throw a runtime exception then when it gets to that point in the program. I gotcha. And said, hey, I tried to use x. Uh, it should be an integer because it's been used here, but it's actually a character pointer, so it'll throw an exception. If it's C, it will not throw an exception, it'll just do it, right? Which is why C is not great. We'll just say, sure, yeah, I can compare those. They're not equal, good. <laughs> okay, so we set this X to be 10. We saw that we went inside here. When we went inside this block, now we're creating a new block in our symbol table where we have here X, which is a character pointer, which has the string testing or points to the string testing. And then we print out x, and here we have a usage of x. Right? And the reason why this x is not mapped to this integer is because we use this table. Right? We don't care about statically what happens. We don't look at the code. We look at the symbol table. And we see, looking from the bottom up, where's the first instance of x? Right here. So this is the x that we're printing out, and that's what this x refers to. And from this point, it's been exactly the same. Right? This is the same behavior as statically. The, key is that this mapping is being done dynamically while the program is executing, whereas in static, the compiler does it before it ever ex before the program ever executes. Okay, so now once we leave this block, we no longer have that symbol table entry that was associated with that block. It goes away, the block is out of scope, and now we're calling foo, so now we jump into foo. When we get to foo, we start a new block. And inside this block, there's one character declaration of a variable C, which has the character C inside of it. Then foo is called, and foo calls bar, and now we're inside, again, another, uh, another basic, uh, another block, so a new scope. So we create a new block entry in our symbol table. And here we say there's an integer x that has value 100. And then we call baz, so again we get into a new block, but here we have no scope, so we don't create, we don't have to create a new uh, entry. Uh, sorry, there's no declaration here. And now when I get to this line and I say, what x is this? Which x does this refer to? What's the value of that x? A hundred. So this x. Whereas before, and this is the big difference where things start to change, right? Before this x referred to this declaration of x constantly. Anytime this line was executed, this x always referred to this global x. But here, in dynamic scoping, because the path we took through this program, one of those blocks declared a new x, that x is then available to any function that gets called. So now when we reference x, we're actually referencing this x inside bar. So this x references bar, it's going to should print out 100, and it's not going to reference this x, right? Even though statically that's what would happen, this is the key difference with dynamically. And we can see that this would change if we didn't call, uh, let's say we called baz from foo instead of bar, then this x would then refer to the global x, it would refer to 10, because there is no other x in, essentially, uh, this represents basically the call stack right now, right? We have baz, which has no declaration, so it's not on here, we have baz, then we have bar, then we have foo, then we have the global scope. So this represents the call chain that we're currently at. Cool. Then when we set x to 1,337, it has to do the same thing, right? It has to resolve that usage of x to that declaration of x and say, okay, this x maps to this thing, so I'm going to change this to be 1,337. I'm done. So then when we leave this scope, right, we're going to return back to whoever called us. And so when we return here, we clean up the scope associated with this in our symbol table, but there is no scope associated here. So then we get to bar, we get to the end of bar, and then what happens here? 
What if, how does our symbol table change? Remove the last one. Yeah, we removed the last one, right? Now this x is no longer in scope, right? So it goes away. We can never, we can no longer access that variable x. It went away. Now we get here and we say print out the values of x and c. What x does it resolve to? 10, or c revolves to c. Right, so we look up, we see a name of C, we see the value C, and we look up X, and we see X is first in this global X of 10. So it should print out 10C. And then we get out from here, this block goes away, and then finally we get to the end, and if we had any more, we, that would execute over at the end. Right, so if we had a version of GCC that supported dynamic scoping, which does not currently exist, and so you have to make this up, um, but if we were using a version of GCC that was exactly the same semantics except for dynamic scoping, if we compiled this, it would hopefully, well, I guess if I use the W all, it should tell me that I don't have a return value for main. So bad me, warning. But uh, it doesn't because it's not real. And then if we were to run this fake imaginary program, it would say testing 110C. Right, this is different from the static scoping. Yeah, it should be, right? Yes? So obviously this is an opportunity for those of us that are used to static scoping that if we had a compiler that did this, we would start screwing things up and not know why they screwed up. So that's a disadvantage. What would be a clear advantage to this method? Right, so I'll pose that to everyone. Why? What? Could be the use of something like this, right? So I guess I don't know. It's, I guess it's a matter of preference. Is it a disadvantage because you don't understand how to use it in the semantics and you're not used to it? I mean, you say that about anything, right? Like Lisp has a bunch of parentheses. If you try to read Lisp, it just looks insane. But over time, the syntax goes away, and that's just a syntactic issue that you start to understand and deal with, right? So what could be some benefits of dynamic scoping? Or drawbacks. You can go either one. Yeah. I'd say a drawback is it's harder to read the code. Harder to read? Is that actually harder to read? Or what is it harder to do? And so you don't need to care about who's 
in, in your intermediaries to pass your configuration options ultimately to C. Yeah. In that example, though, that would rely on B not messing with the variables that A declares. Right? Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah, it would be that, uh, yeah, you'd have to depend on B not declaring new variables that would shadow your copies of variables. Um, so yeah, you can think about like a library that's like, it's a middleman library, but it's not doing much. It's just kind of passing stuff around. Or like, actually on uh, Emacs, it uses this a lot. So like dynamic variables are, uh, if I'm, there's different, each buffer, each window you're looking at has like global variables. Like, uh, I don't know, the number of, do you want double spaces after every period? Or what's the size of the window of text that you want or something like that? And so when you instantiate a new buffer, you can do that easily by just changing the values that you want, and the dynamic scoping will get those values. Yeah. Can you simulate this by just passing everything by reference? And is that a filter? How's that for Can you simulate this by passing everything by reference? Like you pass the X by reference for every single function. Wouldn't it be similar? No. Well, could you? Yes. The problem is, is so for every function, you have to basically take in this table, right? Every function needs to have the current symbol table to be able to read from it, right? You can't just change, because Baz, you can't just say it passes in a reference to x, because Baz itself may not use x. And any function that Baz calls may then modify x. So then you have to pass x along that way. Um, we'll actually look at uh, pass by reference and pass by value, all that kind of stuff later. Um, so another benefit, which may not be quite so, so we're thinking a lot on the, um, on the usage side, right? But on the writing, actually, a compiler or an interpreter, it's actually pretty easy. I mean, you can do this. You can interpret this line by line and build this symbol table as you're interpreting it. This is just a hash table, right? I mean, basically. And then you have different scopes. You create a new hash table. You create a lookup function. And so it's actually really easy to write an interpreter. So dynamic scoping is actually easier to implement than static scoping. I would say it's probably hmm, it's probably faster for compilation. It's slower for execution. Because for every variable usage, you have to look up what variable are you referring to now. Right? Whereas in C, it actually, as we'll see eventually, it assigns memory locations to all of these. Like for this global X, it's going to assign a fixed address of 0804005A. And then any time here, it says, I know this X refers to this global X. This means I set memory address 08040058 to 1337, right? That's one assembly instruction. Whereas here in dynamic scoping, when it gets to this line, it says, okay, I need to look up in the table what, who has the memory address of X, the name X. And then it has to look this up in this table. So it's a much more, it's a slower process. Okay. So you said before that C does not um, allow Scoping. Scoping, sorry. Um, can you give us an example of a language that does? Yes. Uh, the, lisps, li the lisps are the big example. So in common list, you actually can specify a per variable basis. You can say this variable, I want this to be dynamically scoped. And other variables are statically scoped. Uh, Emacs lisp, which is a derivative of lisp that Emacs is written in. I think it's called elisp. Uh, it's all dynamic scoping, so it's way different. Um, and so, yeah, and I believe, if I remember correctly, like early versions of either Python or Ruby of one of those scripting languages used dynamic scoping because it was way easier to implement. Yeah. So, assuming that you print that and int main, we just change it to percentage D mm -hmm. without a digit. So, static would give an error, right? Because it'll say incompatible with type. Yes. And dynamic won't give an error. It'll be a runtime error. Correct. Be unless the compiler was super smart and was able to analyze and say, even though I know I'm doing dynamic scoping, I know that this X will always refer to this X because it's in the same scope. 
Right? So in this case, it may be able to check it, but in the general case, like this x, this x could be a character pointer right now, right? So that should be an error. So yeah, so you do get more, a little bit more benefits from static scoping in that you can do type errors because you know the usage of every type. When you see the, a name, you know exactly what the type is of that name. Whereas with dynamic scoping, the type of that name can depend on the path and execution. Yeah? Hey, well, will this appear on the midterm? No. Sem uh, no semantics on the midterm up till syntax analysis. Then you all get up and leave. Oh. <laughs> Already been here for half hour. You might as well do another twenty minutes. Yeah. Um, the, the midterm could have um, recursive uh, predictive parsing. Anything from syntax analysis. Any questions on this stuff? Cool. Okay. So. We've been talking about, basically, essentially right now we've been talking about resolving variable names. Right, I'm trying to say. Uh, actually, okay, so another cool thing we didn't talk about and that I didn't actually include in here, right, but even here, when we see a call to a function foo, how do we know which function foo we're talking about? In dynamic scoping, we have to look it up in the symbol table and map foo to the function on line four. So this actually gives you then very powerful capabilities. If I wanted to overwrite or hook a function in a different library and say I really hate the way they're comparing strings, I'm just gonna define in my scope a string comparing function and I know that library is gonna use that function. Right, so that's actually a pretty powerful primitive to be able to hook other functions and say, I want to execute my function instead of your function. Is there how overrides works in APIs, Android or any other? You can, you can write at override and write the same function definition? Okay. Yes, we're gonna get to that. Although that's, that's actually a very good question. That's more on, um, class and class hierarchy and like super classes and subclasses and being able to like hide your parent caller and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's very similar, but think about that applied to anything. You could overwrite any function in any library or whatever to do what your specific program wants. It's actually super handy sometimes. Um, so I, I, keep, I guess I'll keep plugging list. Uh, list also has super cool ways to like uh, like common list, you can define all different types of, you can like completely replace a function with your own function. You can also, they have like before or after hooks where you can say before this function runs, I want to run this little, some code that does something first, maybe it translates parameters or something, or you can hook the after of a function, so you can do stuff after a function's called. Anyways, it's really cool. Uh, it's kind of like if you're ever familiar with, uh, I can't remember the name of the Python where you can augment functions with like an at symbol or something. Like you can have attributes of functions that do other things. So you can, anyways. Cool, okay, so, got way off there. Okay, so we've been talking about names, right? How do we resolve variable names to the instances of that variable, right? How do we resolve a usage to a declaration? That's what we've been looking at. And we looked at two different types, static and dynamic. Now I want to think about when you write your programs, how does the compiler know when you call a function, how does it actually know which function to call? Right? It's not magic. The whole point of this class is there's no magic involved. Just like we just looked at is when you write a variable name, specifically how does the compiler figure out what thing you mean? Right? That's the scoping rules and the scoping strategy. So now we want to see, when you see a function call, which function gets called? So how does this work in like C? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm going to say uh, overrides like the number of parameters to change it, but C doesn't offer uh, overrides. So, so how, does it, how does it figure out? Just go up to the top of the program and look at the declaration. Almost. 
most. Yes. Yeah. So, but what is it looking for specifically? How is it? So is it? Does so. Right. So it function. Yeah. So the key question is, and think about your different programming languages that you use. Right. When you write. When you define a function or define several functions and you're calling a function, how, how does the compiler and how do you, because you're writing this, how do you know which function is going to get called? Right? So with names, what would this be if we're just using the name? Parameters can be different. Yeah, wait, say it again. Uh, reference. Uh, so wait, so wait, let's, okay. Uh, sorry. Okay, so in C, so how does C specifically do function resolution? What was it? Name. Just the name. Doesn't matter. You can't, you actually can't define a function in the same scope that has a different number of arguments in C. Because in C, a function is its name. That is it. So when you see a function call, the way you look up which function that maps to is just comparing the names. So what else could you do? You're a language designer. You could look at just the name. What are the pros and cons there? Only one name for a function. Yeah, only one name for a function. I mean, is that, well, but isn't that good? Don't you want one name for a function? So you want to call a function by multiple names? Like have length and size and number of elements and Doesn't that drive you crazy when you're programming Java and like arrays are what is it dot length, but lists are dot size method? I don't know why that's relevant, but it bugs me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess oh it is relevant because do you want like so do you want multiple names for the same function? What's polymorphism? No. Overloading is different. Yeah, so how so let's say you only have functions, so we're not even considering objects right now, right? Take it back to simple C. So what's the scope of functions? Can you define a function inside of a function in C? No. No. Would you? I mean, we'll talk about that later, right? But that would mean that a function would be local to only that scope, right? Okay. So you can't do that in C. So all your functions have to be what scope? Global. So you have global scope, and function resolution is just on names. What are the pros and cons? I guess a pro would be continuity. Continuity in what sense? Uh, like you said, you're saying. Yeah, so when you're looking, it helps it can help readability when you're looking at code and you see a function called, you can go to the exact definition of that function, right? There's no ambiguity. You know when you see string compare, strcmp, it is the string compare function. Of course, assuming they actually included the string.h or whatever header file you need for that and didn't define their own string compare, because otherwise then you're you have major problems. Right? So names can be so just doing names can be good. What's the downside? Why would you want two functions with the same name and different parameters? That sounds confusing to me. Because it just uses a different name. So give me an example, yeah, in the back. Yeah, so let's say, um, like, oh, well, there's a couple ways you can go. Yeah, you can do comparison, right? So like you have strcmp, right, string compare. Um, do, would you ever want it to compare two integers? No? 
don't ever want to know if two integers are less than or equal to each other? can't use that function, right? The string compare, that name strcmp, or let's say we wanted to write just a cmp function, right? Now we have to choose, what do we want to compare? Do we compare character pointers? Do we compare integers? What about doubles? What's the difference between comparing doubles and integers? Nothing, right? I mean, to us as the programmer, we don't really care. We just want to compare these things. Right? And so if I only use names to look up things, then I cannot define a function. So every function has to have a specific number of parameters, and each of those parameters has to have the exact same type. So you cannot write a function. Or think about like a function like um, maximum or something, right? That takes in, let's say, two integers and returns you the max integer. That's kind of crappy because then you have to write a max3 function that takes in three integers if you ever want to compare three integers, and a max4 function that takes in four integers as parameters, right? And now you start getting into this crazy nonsense. So then, to solve this problem, what can we do for function resolution? What can we start looking at maybe then? What was that? Number of parameters. So we can look at number of. Oh, shoot. Okay. We can look at the number of parameters. What else, though? Would that help us in our CMP example? Uh, or compare? Know, the type of parameters? We want to look at the type of parameters. What else? Return value. Return value. Why would we want to look at the return value? We will dynamically select uh, which function should be called. Uh, yeah, right. Maybe we want two types of return. One that returns. Uh, okay, that's. You can't do that because when you call it, you don't know if you want to. Like if you have void and int compare, right? And you have the same number of parameters and the same type. But you have no idea which one you want to return. Yes, so that's. So if I have like void, cmp, and int cmp, right? And then I have the function call cmp, which one should get called? Why? Why? Because it's not returning any value. But is this valid C code? Yes. Do you have to use the return value? You can see? No. Maybe I don't want the return type in this specific specific instance, right? Maybe I just want the side effects of calling the CMP function. Right? So we'll look at it in C. C like languages, you don't want to use the return type, but you can. For when we get into um, type inference and being able to infer the types everywhere, you actually can use the return value to select the function. Um, so we can use names, we can use names plus return types. We can use names plus parameter numbers, which is all the stuff that we were talking about. We can use names, parameter numbers, parameter types. And so really what this refers to, and maybe you've heard the term function signature before. Well, okay, you're learning the term function signature. So this, these rules of what does it mean to actually, like how do we refer to functions? If we're just referring to them by name, then the signature is just the name, right? We know when we see strcmp, it maps to one specific function, and that's all we need to know. When we look at the call to strcmp, we don't need to care about how many parameters are being called. I mean, we'll have to do that to worry about if that matches semantically with what we're trying to call, but at least I know exactly which function should be called. But if I'm using names, parameter number, and parameter types, then I had better have a way to specify that, right? And that would be the function signature. So for instance, here, if I have, let's see. You're ordering us a pizza. 
Is that a modem? Somebody dialing into AOL? What? Oh, cool. Okay, awesome. So let's do this function signatures. That's super cool. Uh, that like brought me back very weirdly. All right. Right, so here if we think about the function signature, right here for this CMP function, we have CMP, usually we'll write it like this. So the name of the function and then a vector of, do I care that this is named X and this is named A? No. No, do I care that this is named Y and this is named B? No, so this is the name comparison and the parameter types are an integer and an integer. And this one is CMP int int. So these have the exact same function signature because in, let's say this language, we don't care about the return types. Right? But if I change this int to a double, Right? Now this function signature changes to int double, and now these are different functions. So then the question is that when I invoke this function, can I map it back to the correct place? Cool. All right. Uh, okay, so for midterm on Friday, try to come early. So that, and when you sit, don't, we have 230 people in a room for 438, so don't sit next to somebody, spread out. Um, come early so you get the midterms. The TAs will be proctoring. I'm going to have a lot of people watching everything. Don't make me have to give you a zero on the midterm.